Uh, hi guys, uh, welcome to one of your first lessons for astronomy and meteorology, um, an introduction to this topic. You're in this class most likely because you were interested in earth science when you took it with me earlier in your high school uh, career. So um, I am really excited to be able to teach this as a, an advanced course uh, in these two main major topics of earth science. And before we actually get into anything, I figured I'd just give an introduction to the topic and talk about a few things that were interesting to me in the past when I first went into this topic as well when I was your age and a little bit older. So just as, as a way of introduction to this topic, let's start with this big image. And we're going to talk about this image later on uh, this semester. But uh, this is the Hubble telescope image of what's called the deep field. It's an image that was taken back in about 1995. Uh, they exposed a photograph for 10 days. So imagine if you were to if, uh, if you know anything about digital SLR cameras, if you were to open up the shutter on your camera and leave it open for 10 days, it would gather all the light for 10 days. And so this was pointed at the darkest place in the night sky for 10 days. And they didn't expect to, to get anything out of this. In fact, it was super expensive to expose a shot for 10 days on the Hubble. It's like millions of dollars to do that. So they weren't sure whether they were going to get anything out of it. And they ended up with this photograph, which as you can see, there's like thousands of specks of light. And every single one of those specks of light is actually a galaxy in and of itself. And you can kind of see one down here in the bottom right hand corner. There's a spiral galaxy, as you can see. So every one of those galaxies has billions of stars, 200 billion stars in, in each one of them approximately. So we're talking thousands of galaxies, billions of stars, and we're talking about a really, really tiny speck of the night sky. So if you were to take the whole entire sky, we're talking billions of galaxies with billions of stars, and we're talking big numbers, right? So that's what astronomy is all about, is looking at the vast expanse of the universe and trying to understand all of that. And that's what we're going to talk about over these next uh, few weeks. So I figured I'd start with that. Now, in our context of the universe, we're here. Okay, uh, Obviously, we haven't taken a picture of the Milky Way galaxy in which we live, but we live on an outer arm, something like where it's pointing in the picture there. And uh, that outer arm, uh, because we're swinging around out there, we can actually observe our own universe as well as uh, the universes that surround the Milky Way galaxy. So we're out there, and we'll talk about the Milky Way galaxy a little bit more in depth as we move along here. But we're in a very privileged place, okay, on a planet that can sustain life at a perfect distance away from our star that allows us to actually survive here on, on, on our planet. And we'll talk about that as well as we go. So we have a lot to talk about, as you can see, I'm, I'm saying that a lot. Now, just to give you guys an idea of, of what Earth science is all about. Earth science, when you guys took it in ninth grade or eighth grade, it's really a bunch of things all smashed together into one year. And technically, you could break it down into three topics. Now, what I did for this course is I broke it down into two. So we're going to talk about astronomy in the fall, meteorology in the spring. And so I'm just kind of cutting to one particular place of interest. Now, I'll talk about this later on. But I, I when I was in, at Cornell as an undergrad, I focused on geology. So it's actually as, by doing these two courses, astronomy and meteorology, I'm stretching myself. I have to kind of relearn some things that I learned way back then. But my focus was really on geology. But I have an interest in astronomy and meteorology as well. Obviously, I'm an earth science teacher. Okay. Now, what is science in general? Science is all about gathering information, right? It's about organizing, and analyzing, and looking at things around us and saying, I wonder why these things are the way they are. And so we go about testing our hypotheses and our, our ideas about them through experimentation. But astronomy, in particular that we're going to be talking about is an interesting science because it's a little bit, bit different than physics and chemistry. Physics and chemistry, you can take stuff and you can experiment it in the lab, right? You can actually look at it. But astronomy, you can't take a star and bring it over here and say, what's going on here, right? It's all about observation. So we call it an observational science. We look at things in the sky and we use new instruments to kind of figure out stuff that's going on out there in the in the universe. And then we test our hypotheses based upon new evidence that we might find. So it is 
a little bit different than some of the other sciences that are out there. We call it observational. We'll, we'll be talking about observations of the sky in the next uh, month or so. It's also a historical science. And, and then by that, I mean that it is something that we, we kind of investigate almost like a crime scene, right? Everything that you see out there in the night sky is really, really far away. And because it's really, really far away, the light had to travel to us, and we'll talk about that. So everything that we see in the night sky is actually historical. It's in the past, right? And in fact, the nearest star besides our own is four and a half light years away, which means it's four and a half years old by the time we see the light from it. So everything is historical. And so it's kind of like paleontology. We're investigating the past when we look at the night sky. So you can consider astronomy to be both observational as well as historical. Later on in the spring, we're going to be talking about stuff like this, right? Hurricane Laura just hit our, our coastline uh, down in Texas and Louisiana, um, and obviously pretty devastating, a lot of storm surge, and we'll talk about that, right? But our planet is something where we have a lot of interacting parts, which is why Earth science was so broad. And we consider Earth science to be system science, meaning that we have lots of different parts of it that are working together to affect something else in some other location. So when we talk, why am I teaching astronomy before meteorology? Because where we are in our orbit around the sun and how we're tilted and how fast we spin and why we have a moon going around us, all of that affects the weather and the atmosphere. And that affects the stuff that's going on on the surface. So every little part of this affects the other parts is what I'm saying. And so when I did my degree at Cornell, my degree was called the science of earth systems okay because i had to study all these different systems to understand what the earth was all about it's not science of earth it was earth systems okay and i had the opportunity to either focus on geology or meteorology or astronomy and i decided geology was my course uh, that i wanted to go into now how did i get interested in it in the first place well when i went to college I went to a community college first and I transferred to Cornell and that's actually a really good way to get into Cornell if you want to do it that way. I wanted to go into landscape architecture, something totally unrelated to what I'm doing right now. I wasn't good at it, right? I wasn't an artist. And so I decided, let me, let me change my degree. And so I got interested in astronomy and geology because at the time Cornell was in charge of uh, the Mars Rover uh, back in 2004. And there is a, a professor there, Steve Squires, he just retired last year. And he was kind of the head honcho. He was the astronomer at Cornell that was in charge of the Mars Rover Opportunity back in 2004. And it had great success. And everybody was talking about Cornell's research program on Mars Rovers. And they're still involved in this now. The Perseverance Rover was just launched. Um, and that's going up to Mars. And they're still involved with that. This mission <laughs> accomplished so much more than we wanted to. It's just, it's mind boggling to me. We know more about Mars today than we knew two days ago. Both rovers together showed us that ancient Mars was much more habitable, was much more Earth-like than, than Mars is today. Mars today is a very cold, very dry, very desolate place where not much happens. If you go to the ancient past, compelling evidence for hydrothermal activity, hot water bubbling through the rocks, steam vents, water coming up to the surface, volcanic explosions, lots of impact craters. It was a hot, violent, steamy place. And it was the kind of environment that would have been suitable for some kinds of microbes. All of it very different from the Mars of today, different places that were visited by the two rovers different from one another. And it sort of hints at the complexity that the entire planet must have. This was a great teaching tool. You know, it's been said many times that some of the most important scientific discoveries begin with the words, that's odd. You know, you see something totally unexpected and then you follow it. To take that kind of immediacy of discovery and the true nature of science into the classroom, it was an opportunity to share with them science as it really happens. I work with engineers today who were 18, 19 year old Cornell undergraduates at the beginning of the mission and actually built hardware that's on the rovers. 
There's hardware on the rovers that was built by Cornell undergraduates. They put their initials on it and everything. I can see by the career path they've taken, that the trajectory that their career has taken, that that opportunity uh, early in the mission opened doors for them, at least in their, their own heads in terms of what they thought was possible for them. I mean, if you had told me around the time we landed that Spirit and Opportunity were going to each accomplish one quarter or one tenth of what they ultimately did, I would have been thrilled. And it's because of the longevity of the vehicles. You know, Spirit lasted six some odd years, Opportunity 14 and a half when we were designing it for 90 days. Mars just kept giving us new stuff. And so the payoff has been immensely greater than anything any of us ever in our wildest dreams conceived of. We have changed the way in which people perceive Mars. Every morning, you can open up your computer and you can go to a public website and you can see new vistas of Mars. They're always someplace new and we're climbing mountains and we're descending into craters and these beautiful panoramas and all of a sudden Mars becomes a place that humans can relate to, that you can imagine being. You've got these machines that are there that are built on very human scales doing very human-like things. The kind of exploration that we do with rovers is very, very accessible. It's easy to understand. These are robots. They're looking at rocks. It's not that complicated. And I always felt that the unique accessibility of this mission gave us both a special opportunity and a special obligation to really try to share it with the public. And we tried very, very hard to do that. And if part of the legacy of this mission is that a whole bunch of young people who saw that thought that that's really cool, but I bet I could do better if that thought hit them and it helped to push their career in a certain direction, that ultimately could be possibly the most important part of our legacy. And so if you're interested in engineering as a possible degree, so there's astro engineering, you can get into this really, really cool stuff that they do and some of the other stuff they're researching out there. So a lot of robotics as well as a lot of engineering stuff. So their, their earth and atmospheric department that I was in is also connected with their engineering department. They're right next to each other on campus. Really, really cool stuff that they're doing. So this might be a possible thing that you might be interested in in the future. Now, speaking of which, there's lots of different careers that you can go into in the earth sciences. Obviously, you had an interest in it because uh, you took this class. Okay? And you can choose to drop it if you want to. But if you're interested in this stuff, there's a lot of possible places you can go with this. Okay, You might be interested in meteorology and be a meteorologist, Wayne Mahar, or whatever. Right? But you can also be an atmospheric scientist, which just studies the climate in general. Uh, you can you can work for NOAA, which is a national oceanic and uh, national oceanic and atmospheric administration. You could get into engineering and and talk about astro engineering and, and other planets and exploring other planets. So there's lots of possible places you can go. Now, obviously, I chose teaching because I was really interested in that. Um, but again, there's a lot of places you can go with this. A lot of opportunities for you out there, and it's a it's a budding field. Okay, so again, I hope you guys enjoy this class this upcoming school year. I hope you learn something. Um, I'm going to learn a lot because I'm relearning, relearning things too. So that's pretty much it for now. That's just an introduction to the topic, and uh, we'll talk more. All right.